Good morning. An early start for day seven on the Commonwealth Games. We're up for the men's marathon, a race that has a history that goes back to the fifth century and a battle between the Athenians and the Persians. The Athenians won and a gentleman by the name of Pheidippides ran to Athens with the good news. Not a particularly good run for him because he keeled over and died, so the legend goes. And John Davies, his uh, time not recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, but apparently he ran 42 kilometres or close to it. He ran a long way. What's the actual basis of the distance? Uh, where does the 385 yards come from? Well, that happened in a, a, a London marathon where the Olympics were held uh, some time ago. And the Royal Box happened to be in a certain place and they wanted the marathon to finish right opposite the Royal Box. And that's how come we got 26 miles and 385 yards, which now converts to 42 point something kilometres. Uh, uh, what sort of time are we expected to see today, John? Well, I think the time uh, will not be so important. Uh, Jeff. It's going to be a tough marathon today, I think, because of the conditions. And I would expect if anybody goes under 2.10, they're going to do an excellent job. Uh, Lorraine, take us through the last few hours from, say, 3 o'clock this morning to now. How would the athletes have been preparing themselves? Well, I think they probably had a hard night's sleep because of the high humidity. I certainly did. And I'm sure they got up very early. Um, probably a lot of these people probably had no sleep at all. Um, they probably would have been up um, three or four so that they could have had a breakfast and get it digested and so that all the time they get to the start line. How, what sort of um, mental preparation have they had to go through? Well, I think the mental preparation comes over a long period of time, probably over the last four to six months or even a year for a lot of them. Mm. And so every time you go out training, I think it's getting your focus ready right for this day. So on this day, you're going to see the combination of a a whole lot of work and mental focus. When you're actually running the marathon, I mean, the physical difficulties are obvious. What's the mental side of things? What, how difficult is it mentally for you? Oh, I think the marathon is a particularly tough mental event. Um, it's very much a waiting game. It's very much an act of faith in what you can do and that you can last over the whole distance. I think the marathon really has an allure in that way because it's so far and you're, you're battling the element of distance as well as going for speed over that so john a, an act of faith lorraine was saying uh, who's going to have the best faith in themselves today well uh, the kenyan guys by the name of uh, what douglas wakahuri in particular is one uh, there's a tanzanian jume kanga there's robert de costello and steve monaghetti from australia you can go on with the numbers of people and the combinations in this race and that's what's so good about a marathon you see in some shorter track races you can look at the fa the form favorite and you can say that guy is probably going to win. When it comes to a marathon, it's more than just form. There's a bit of luck in there, as, as Lorraine says. The preparation on the morning, the psychology of the event all comes into it. They're an intriguing event. All right, now we uh, just had a chat with John Davies and Lorraine Moller about the marathon we're going to see today. We now have pictures through from the course. You see them uh, warming up there. What, what sort of time do you think we'll see today? I'm not wanting to predict a time. I was trying honest. to put you on the spot there, <laughs> John, are. by casually tossing the question in. You are, but the big races don't tend to be won in fast times, like the Olympic Games races and so on. And if anybody today goes under 2.10, as I say, it will be brilliant. So I'm predicting a time of around about 2.10. What about... Uh, the Kiwis, Lorraine, in the race today, will we expect to see them shine at the start or at all? Well, I don't think they'll be there right at the start because I think there's a very fast field. I think it'll break up and I think with the Kiwis you'll see them running probably a more conservative race and hoping to come through in the later stages. The wind may affect uh, the tactics in that sense and slow people down on the first part of the race because it looks like it might be a headwind, so that could have our New Zealanders up a little bit. Well, we'll let the two of you go now and uh, get onto the commentary team and join Brendan Telfer on course. Well, thank you, Jeff, and uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our coverage of the 1990 Commonwealth Games Men's Marathon. This is the scene down at the start line by the West Haven Boat Marina right underneath, the, one of the landmarks, of course, of Auckland City, the Auckland Harbour Bridge. And the big question this morning is just what effect is this humidity going to have on this field of 29. That's the view from the start line looking back towards the city. It's a very small field of just 29 competitors, but it's a quality field, as John Davies and Lorraine Moller had just mentioned. In fact, it's probably the first time that we've got a marathon where we can say that one quarter of the entire field have run a marathon under two hours and 10 minutes. Not too many signs yet of the actual competitors of, as we said, just a field of less than 30 starters seen here at the start of this marathon vastly different from what we 
normally associate from those huge scenes of thousands of athletes milling around the start and usually an atmosphere of great festivity and a carnival like atmosphere but today looks to be rather tense and quiet down there at the Auckland waterfront there's the man who's hoping to become the first Commonwealth runner to win three successive marathons number 0027 the great Rob De Costello from Australia so it's 21 degrees a very humid day in Auckland as Lorraine Moller mentioned 6 percent that's the humidity reading at the moment the good news, I suppose, from that information there for these runners is the fact that there is very little wind, just a gentle puff coming along the waterfront off the nearby sea, and it's cloudy and warm. There's a lot of uh, misty sort of rain around Auckland at the moment, and I'm sure some of these competitors will be hoping that uh, the humidity lifts and the day becomes a lot cooler because it'll be very interesting to see uh, John Davies and Lorraine Muller just how these European athletes in particular cope with the humidity. Well, no, no doubt about that in that uh, the humidity will affect people. 96%, that makes it really tough. And one of the things, of course, that happens uh, with high humidity is you seem to think that you're sweating more, but you in fact aren't. You get a lot of water on your body, but it doesn't evaporate and act as a cooling system. And so these would be some of the toughest conditions that Auckland could turn on in that sense. Well, there's some good advice being given there by number 1046, although he probably doesn't realise it. Fabio Sikanyika from Zambia taking on plenty of fluid before the race starts. And fluid is important. Uh, when these guys have been asleep, they've been expiring water out of their bodies. And this is one of the problems about starting an early morning marathon that these chaps have to do, is that you have to hydrate well before it. Uh, perhaps Lorraine could talk a little bit more about that. Well, one of the big factors in a marathon, of course, is overheating. And you really need to have a lot of water. Um, and you need to take a lot of water on the course, especially on a day like this. And in just a short while, we'll be taking you down to the waterfront and speaking to uh, our two men out on the course today, Grant Nisbet and Rod Dixon, who will be able to give us a better indication of just what the conditions are like down there at the start. This is the course the field will run on. As we said, they start underneath the Auckland Harbour Bridge. And the course, in fact, is a very tight and compact one, probably at its two extremities. It's not much more than 12 kilometres out to St Heliers, where they turn around and make their journey back towards Auckland City. The bulk of this marathon will be run between St Heliers and Parnell. five circuits between Parnell and St Heliers before they finish after they leave the Auckland Harbour Bridge. That's the course for the 1990 Marathon the Commonwealth Games. And I think Coming soon to Television One. Across the water, we're going somewhere for treasure hunts. I don't know where it is. You don't know. Welcome back to our coverage of the 1990 Men's Marathon. This is the scene a peaceful, tranquil scene looking across the inner Waitemata Harbour towards Auckland City from the start of the men's marathon underneath the Auckland Harbour Bridge and we understand all fired up with these high-tech gear down there underneath the Auckland Harbour Bridge is Rod Dixon. Good morning, Rod. First of all, tell us, what are the conditions like down there? Well, Brent, uh, I'm actually at M Mechanics Bay uh, and uh, I'm standing up on uh, the Dove Meyer Robinson Park which gives me a good view right down to the harbour side uh, right down to the Air New Zealand building, down to my left and to my right, out to the, the bays. Uh, very strong wind getting up here, and we're still uh, just almost on start time, of course, but uh, it is a strong wind, and I think uh, as we've been talking about this humidity, the athletes are going to have to take a, quite a bit of water on early in order to uh, stave off that dehydration. We'll be hearing more from uh, Rod Dixon and uh, Grant Nisbet uh, during the course of this race as we just look at this field of 29 starters from 15 countries. A number of the countries competing in this marathon have got their optimum number of competitors. Three, we have uh, three from Australia, three from New Zealand of course, uh, three from England, uh, three from Kenya and three from Lesotho. There he is, one of the favourites for the race, number 571 in the middle of your screen, Douglas Wakahuri man who has prepared assiduously for this particular marathon. He's been in New Zealand since the first week of December. In fact, he's done a lot of his training around the Auckland City waterfront, so he's very familiar with this course. Alongside of him, we saw Jeff Whiteman, a rather unknown figure to us here in New Zealand, one of the three English runners. 
number 56, Steve Monaghetti, the man who made such a dramatic entry into the marathon ranks in his debut in 1986 in Edinburgh. Rex Wilson right beside him there on the left in the black of New Zealand also. And the men's marathon, one of the feature events of the 1990 Commonwealth Games is underway. Seven o'clock in the morning, underneath the Auckland Harbour Bridge, this small, compact but elite field of 29 runners is off on this long 42-kilometre journey. A journey which will be the winning athlete about two hours and ten minutes, but some may still be on their feet after two and a half hours. Well, interesting, Rex Wilson right up there beside Steve Monaghetti, and at the other end of the field you could see probably the oldest man in the race, John Campbell. Campbell doesn't like to start fast, likes to work into it, and you can see him there with his number tucked right over the back of his shorts. He's cut his singlet down nicely too, to look as if he's going to uh, get the best ventilation he can on a day like this. A spectacular sight from the air with the famous Auckland landmark, the Auckland Harbour Bridge, which ferries hundreds of thousands of thousands of commuters every day from the northern suburbs of Auckland into the city. The two contrasting modes of transport very much in evidence there is the traffic on the Harbour Bridge, but underneath the bridge, some of the finest marathon runners on the wor in the world off on a different journey. The organisers of the course were a bit concerned about uh, this part of the run in that there are speed control humps, I guess you call them, around the, the road, and there are about four or five of them for the runners to negotiate. And at one stage, there's one there you can see with a zigzag white paint on it. And uh, the organisers were concerned that perhaps a runner might trip on it, but lots of people have run over them and checked them out, and they found them to be OK. John Davies, on the question of the course, it's probably a good opportunity now to, to clarify some of the misconceptions about why this particular marathon is departing from tradition and not finishing in Mount Smart Stadium. I know a lot of people, and I must confess to being one of them, rather disappointed initially when I discovered that this race was not going to finish in the stadium where you always get that magic moment with 30 or 40,000 people waiting with expectation to bring the first runner home. But today they're going to finish out on the streets of Auckland. You were one of the people responsible for choosing this course. Why? You're putting it on me. Well, there are some good reasons for it, and this is not a precedent that we're setting. It has been done before, and the organisers looked at running a course from Mount Smart. Mount Smart Stadium is in the middle of an industrial area. And if you pick a course that comes into Auckland City, you're negotiating a large number of hills. And, of course, being that the 1990 Commonwealth Games are being held in supposedly Auckland and Auckland City, the concept was to try and have a marathon which did cover that part of, uh, of Auckland. And when you look at this course, uh, it, is, it has produced the best times in New Zealand, perhaps other than the Christchurch course, uh, for the 74 Commonwealth Games. Well, I noticed Sir John Campbell making one or two rather disparaging remarks about the course in the newspaper yesterday, suggesting that it might be a little too tight and a little too compact. Well, we have with us Lorraine Muller. Lorraine, if you were running the marathon, would you be happy with this course, or would you, be prefer, would you prefer to finish at Mount Smart Stadium? Well, when I thought I was going to be running this race, I was really happy with the course. Because, as you know, to get to Mount Smart Stadium, you have to negotiate a few hills here. And this course is flat, and I think potentially a very fast course. Maybe not today for the men, just because of the humidity and the way the wind is blowing. But quite often you get a tailwind on this course. And when you do, I think it's potentially very, very fast. And with the Commonwealth Games, and sometimes in the Commonwealth Games, I think... Um, it's not considered um, a world-class event. With a course that's fast, I think you get a lot more credibility if the times are reasonably fast in the eyes of the rest of the world. That's an interesting point. Yes, uh, I think that suggestion was also made some time ago that if this course, in fact, did take the runners up through the hills and dales to Mount Smart Stadium, then perhaps some of these fine international athletes may not have come to Auckland for the marathon. So have we convinced you, Brendan, that this should be where this marathon uh, well, I'm is not, run? I'm not saying I'm convinced, John. Uh, I'm a bit of a conservative on these sort of matters. I think I still would have liked to have seen coming into the stadium. But I guess it's easy for us to say that sitting here at the International Broadcast Centre watching it. But for these fellows who would have had to have climbed a fairly steep course from the 
coast as they are now up to Mount Smart Stadium, it would have been a pretty tough sort of marathon. The uh, organisers have done as much as they can to ensure that there will be a crowd out on the course. Everybody knows where it is. There's nothing. You don't pay to come and see it when it's on the waterfront. And uh, the other thing about finishing in the stadium, in the Commonwealth Games, they don't run the marathon with the closing ceremony, for instance, which they do on a closing day like they do in the Olympic Games. And uh, it was thought that we wouldn't get a big crowd there. But down in St Heliers, we're expecting a big crowd. And they've put the Star Vision screen from Mount Smart Stadium out there overnight so that people can go and watch the marathon uh, on television, if you like, at the finish line and see the runners come past several times. So let's have a look now at some of these runners. Of course, it's a very early of the race. And as we mentioned, uh, the there are seven sub 2 r 10 marathon runners in this field out to the right of the picture in the almost lime green color is number 937 one of the three Tanzanian runners in this field that's Simon Robert and alongside of him 938 is Alfredo Shahanga from Tanzania also brother of Gihamis Shahanga who won the 1978 marathon at the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton but the big threat from Tanzania is their third runner Juma Ikanga, the man who won the New York marathon last year and in fact was ranked number one in the world over this distance in 1989 still making their way through what you might call the industrial area on the Auckland waterfront but uh, very shortly they'll be coming close to the heart of Auckland City Queen Street yes this is uh, probably the worst part of the course in terms of any visual effects some light industrial areas around here some tight turns as you can see the runners having to negotiate but once they've completed this mile they'll be out onto what we call the waterfront proper right through across the bottom of Queen Street as the Australian Three Australians in this race with the Rob Di Castello, their most prominent one at the moment, right in the middle of that leading pack. Number 936 is Juma Ikanga. He's, as I said, the third of the three Tanzanian runners, running in a slightly different strip from his two compatriots. And number 047, 0147. CBO Sikanika from Zambia. No sign of the New Zealanders yet. They must be tucked at the back of that leading bunch. We can see Robert DiCostello out to the right and towards the rear of that leading bunch. The three New Zealanders, Rex Wilson, John Campbell, and Paul Hurley, who won the New Zealand Commonwealth Games Marathon Trial three or four months ago. In fact, you can see Rex Wilson just over the far side of the leading runners there, just... He's on the far side from the camera, and right with him was Paul Hurley, and that's good to see these guys up there at the moment. And uh, John Campbell right at the very back of that picture, to the right. Uh, running alongside of Robert DiCostello. Brad Kemp, the Australian, there as well. Three English runners in the field. Names not terribly familiar to us around this part of the world. Gordon Christie, Tony Milosaroff, and Carl Thackeray. Another big name that we haven't mentioned, who we presume is buried somewhere in that leading bunch, is the Welshman Stephen Jones. In fact, they're looking at the leading seven runners. Ikanga Jones, Hussein, the Kenyan, Ibrahim Hussein, who's won both the New York and the Boston Marathons. Douglas Wakahuri, Robert D. Costello, Steve Wanagetti and Tony Malofsaroff, they are the seven that have all gone under two hours and ten for this distance we would expect the winner to come from one of those seven but when you have uh, literally a quarter of the field capable of running under two hours and ten it's really hard to say any one particular athlete is the favorite that's quite right uh, it's going to be interesting to see what develops when the race gets into about the halfway stage but there's the familiar stri strip of Australia number 27 there Rob Di Costello with his familiar waddle too right at the back of the field and that's pretty unusual for him so everybody, I think, is playing a bit of a cat-and-mouse game here, and I think perhaps they are concerned about the wind and the humidity. Still making their way through the industrial sections of the Auckland waterfront, and they won't really get a feel, I suppose, for the marathon until they hit the city section of the waterfront where they'll make some contact with the crowd and probably start to warm to their as they get some support from the footpaths. 
at the moment it's very much this industrial area where you wouldn't expect to be to find many spectators now making your way towards the city portion of the waterfront coming very close to the area where most of the yachts from the Whitbread round the World Yacht Race were tied up. There's Paul Hurley uh, in the white and black there running with John Campbell and he's chosen to wear an alternative New Zealand singlet, one which was used at the World Cross Country Championships. It's got a white back on it and the black and the uh, silver fern on the front. John Campbell there alongside of him as well. Number 598, uh, one of the three Lesotho runners. Ernest Tijala, number 572, that's uh, Daniel. He's the third of the three Kenyan runners, along with Hussein and Douglas Wakahuri. And number 581, that's Ibrahim Hussein. And there's Carl Thackeray, one of the three Englishmen. He's the man that won the English marathon trial for the Commonwealth Games. Running in only his second marathon. He here, along with his two compatriots, Gordon Christie and Tony Malofsaroff, the fastest of the three Englishmen. Uh, Joey Kunga is uh, putting in a little bit of a burst to go into the lead, and we might uh, remember him from Brisbane in 1982 when he and one of his teammates set an absolutely torrid pace right from the start, and they got run down by Rob De Costello at the end. Well, we haven't got any split times yet, but it looks a pretty honest pace, John Davies. Yes, uh, they're moving along quick enough. It's good to see everybody is putting themselves into the race at this stage. Certainly the three New Zealanders are right there in the bunch, and that's good to see. We need some good positive running from these guys. Rex Wilson uh, is our best-performed marathon runner, and uh, he's looking very, very fit. You can just see how angular his face looks. I was going to say thin, but how angular his face looks, and that's always a good sign in a runner. What do you think, Lorraine? Oh, when they start trying to feed you up, you know you're getting fit. So I think uh, Rex is probably in the best shape of his life. That's Rex Books in there, who's just uh, going wide. It's a very patchy piece of road here, as you can see. It's a pretty rough stretch of road, which could probably do with uh, another coat of tar seal. And so these fellows just have to watch their footing here for the next couple of hundred metres. Now Rex is looking very comfortable, as you can see, quite relaxed, breathing very easily. He's uh, thinking about his plan. He's, I guess, concentrating on just conserving energy at this stage, maintaining contact with people, building up his confidence for the race. It's over what they call the Western Viaduct. It's been good of them to keep it down. Sometimes they raise, the, they raise this to let a boat pass under. It's a bit like a railway crossing. But I'm sure the organisers made sure there were no boats coming through today. So now they're coming down towards the city proper. And just a couple of minutes, they'll be passing Queen Street. There you can see the downtown section, the commercial area of Auckland, looming in the background there, just a couple of hundred metres away. Big Air New Zealand house, that uh, tall building in the middle of your picture through this small field of just 29 runners. The two Australians, De Costello and Brad Kemp, the man who won the Australian Marathon Championship there just to the right of the picture. Alongside of him, Sikanyiki, the Zambian runner, the 571, Douglas Wakiluri. As we suspected now that they've reached this part of the city starting to look more like a marathon with people lining the route and I'm sure that as this race develops particularly as they get out towards the eastern extremity of the course St Heliers we will see some very big crowds to watch this race of course it's, it's a work day here in Auckland today after it was a public holiday in the city yesterday anniversary day Many of the office workers, I guess, coming into town just a little earlier today to get a glimpse of the, these marathon runners. This is the only time they'll pass this section of the course. Running past the ferry building where the Whitbread yachts were first tied up when they 
arrived here a couple of weeks ago and of course there'll be a lot of action down here on this part of the waterfront in a couple of days time when the Whitbread race resumes on Sunday. Here's Ibrahim Hussein, the man who seems to have an insatiable appetite for marathons. He ran the Honolulu Marathon just last month, which he won. Now normally he wouldn't have thought he would have been in any condition really to have been a, a factor in a race as competitive as this, but uh, obviously he feels that even though he did run a marathon a month ago, it's not going to detract from his chances of winning this marathon today. Younger, the Tanzanian, the back of the picture there, the small figure. And the five kilometer mark. These athletes taking their first, uh, reaching the first at Brink Station. And as both Lorraine and John Davies have mentioned, in these very humid conditions, it's most important that you keep your fluid intake up right from the wood. later on in the race and most of those runners have their own drink bottles a lot of them will have a glucose drink which is absorbed straight from the gut into the bloodstream um, some runners can't take that I noticed one of the African races just preferred to take water on a day like today the Athletes will lose more water than they have the ability to absorb. So as Lorraine says, taking water early in the race is very important because they're on a long run now, 42 kilometers, and during that time they will lose fluid no matter how much they try to take on during the race. I've been way before and after a marathon in high humidity, and even though I've drunk at every water stop, usually my weight loss is somewhere from five to 10 pounds during the race. And we have a break here. But so one of the Tanzanian runners, it may well be uh, Simon Robert. We'll just catch a glimpse of his number. Number 937, yes, that's uh, Simon Robert, Tanzanian. Very much the number three runner on the Tanzanian team behind Ikanga and Shahanga. And in second place at the moment is uh, Juma Nkanga, so it's Tanzania one and two. And look at this oh, one coming in. I think he's giving him some advice. <laughs> this is right. I mean, I've never seen a guy sprint like this in a race. As you were saying, there was a Kanga in second place. I could see he was really pouring on the pace to catch up with his teammate. And what he's done, he's told him, get off the concrete, which is hard on your legs, and get on through the black top surface, which is very nice to run on. It's very smooth, doesn't knock you around quite so much. So here's the experienced man of Juma Ikanga. It's great to see that, uh, the, 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 uh, I guess, the father of these three runners from Tanzania is out there showing them what to do. Excellent teamwork. Looks like he might have told him to slow down a little bit, but <laughs> here you can see Ikanga putting in that burst. Notice how tall he was striding to catch up with his teammate here, Simon Robert. Come on, mate. Get off the concrete and get onto the Tarsiel. Kanga was how easily he caught up and he's usually has run this way it's almost like a fartlek run for him where he speeds up and slows down and last year when he won New York City Marathon he said finally that he had caught on to the pace running and instead of running 14 16 14 16 for his 5k splits he finally got realized that running 15 15 15 for his 5k splits was a much more less painless way of running it well, they're coming to the point on the course where Rod Dixon will be able to get a very good view of them. He's down there near Mechanics Bay, and we'll be catching up with him in, in just a moment. In fact, uh, Rod, if you could hear me, can you see the field yet? Yes, they're just approaching me now. We're at the top of the rise. The runners have gone to the low side of it, and we've just got it. They're going past us now. Very good reception from the crowd here. The runners will find will find that as they get down into. Uh, the uh, Kahu Bay area are going to bunch back up again. I've just been talking to some runners who have actually come from uh, uh, St. Helier's and they said it's incredibly windy out there, gusting from all angles as you do go through the turns. And he said the humidity is probably the highest he's experienced for a long, long time. 
That's a very interesting rod because it's a dead calm in the middle of the city and certainly where the race began under the Auckland Harbour Bridge it was a very tranquil and peaceful scene. It's interesting that the wind has got up. In fact, uh, our reading at the start there was just a, a wind of, from the nor'east of three knots, but obviously things are a lot different out at the uh, eastern portion of the course at St. Helier, so it'll be interesting to see how the field copes with the wind and the humidity. So they've just gone over the uh, toughest hill on this course at the bottom of Gladstone Road, uh, which just takes them over a bridge over a railway line. Now they're onto the flat part of the course, out onto the waterfront proper. Or in Tamaki Drive. Ikanga in the lead, Thackeray there, Robert Simon, Rex Wilson still up there with the leaders, looking well too, Brad Camp behind him, Douglas Wakahuri, number 0571, Steve Jones, one, number 1114 from Wales, he's one of the top runners in the world. They went through that last kilometre in three minutes and five seconds, which puts them on about two hours nine, two hours ten pace. But of course, it's early stages in the race yet, and they haven't come to what appears to be the really windy section of the course today, which is around St. Helier's, which is the turning point. Now John Campbell, you can see there, and his cutaway black New Zealand singlet, and uh, the back of the field, and he's just gone very close to his home. He, uh, he lives and owns a dairy just up the road from here. So this is very familiar territory for John Campbell. Running past uh, Mechanics Bay, another famous landmark in the history of Auckland. It was here to that stretch of water just to the left where the old flying boats used to take off and land. Coming to the most picturesque part of this course for the next uh, seven or eight kilometres along the Auckland city waterfront around the course now one winds its way around through the city beaches along the stretch of road where most runners and joggers in Auckland whether they're competitive or just social runners have done a lot of their running it's a delightful course to run because one of the virtues of it is that you can run for the best part of eight kilometers without having to worry about the traffic once you get onto the footpath to the left there you can run all the way around to St Helier's Bay without having to worry about cars or traffic lights and you're right in the heart of the city Ikanga, Abraham Hussein, Simon Robert, Rex Wilson, Douglas Wakahuri and Carl Thackeray, the leading group of runners. This is a good running here for these fellows. The road smooth, the bumps and potholes that they encountered around the industrial section they've put behind them and now for the rest of the course in fact it's a very smooth surface it's the scene from the air looking along the stretch of road known as the causeway here but the field starting to string out a little the race has now been in progress for 23 minutes they've covered the best part of seven kilometers there's still 35 kilometers to go so the opening chapter has been run in the 1990 men's marathon every moment of every day something important well, welcome back to our coverage of the 1990 men's marathon as the field wins its way along Tamaki Drive approaching the Okahu Boat Harbour and while we're away an interesting little development the Tanzanians put in a very fast mile and consequently the leading bunch has been split in two. Yeah that's uh, sped up to sub five minute pace which uh, puts them well under two hours ten pace as they came through that mile off the Gladstone Road Bridge but uh, there's a nice little bunch formed up the front here and you could see people taking positions as they adjusted to the wind. Shahanga from Tanzania Robert from Tanzania, Ikanga from Tanzania. These guys like to press the pace, make it hot. Three Tanzanians and two Kenyans, and along with Carl Thackeray, the nearest to the camera in this leading bunch. 29 competitors from 15 countries, but uh, nearly half the field, in fact, over half the field, are from African countries, from Lesotho, from Zambia, from Tanzania, and Kenya. So uh, they put in about a 240 uh, half mile, which means it went over five minutes. 
it's uh, about 5.20 uh, and that's caused the second bunch that have got dropped behind with people that we know are very experienced like Monaghetti, Di Costello, Steve Jones uh, and Douglas Wakahuri and it now to catch up with these guys. As you said, Lorraine, a bit of pace work going on out the front here by Jimmy Kanga doing his fart link in the early morning. And it'll be interesting to see if they pay for it a bit later on because um, uneven pace running is certainly not the most efficient way to run a marathon. It's a difficult decision here for a lot of these runners, especially those on the back of the field, is whether to stay with a fast pace early on and maybe risk um, not being able to run their best race and finish well, or to drift back but then you lose the security and also the support of the group and once you're running in a by yourself in the middle of a race it's much more difficult um, it's a long way out there to be running all alone into the shelter of one of the many pretty bays that line the city beaches along this flank of the inner harbor this is okahu bay which played such a, a poignant part in the proceedings on the opening day of the 1990 Commonwealth Games and there you can see one of the big canoes that was involved in transporting the baton across the harbour, one of the big Maori wakas, which paddled by a hundred warriors along with Paul MacDonald carrying the baton from Torpedo Bay across to Okahu Bay here where it continued on its journey to Mount Smart Stadium on the opening day. Steve Monaghetti taking a drink and then interesting there to see that uh, the competitors are having the drinks handed to them. Yes, uh, I've been a coach on a number of New Zealand teams like the Olympics World Championships and they don't uh, allow that to happen in those events. The organisers here, I guess, making sure that everybody does get their drinks in Seoul, if you remember, we had real problems getting uh, John Campbell and Lorraine their drinks because the uh, the personal drink bottle tables were a real shambles. There just wasn't enough room to put everybody's drink out, and people had to pick them up themselves. It was a bad experience for you, Lorraine, I remember. Yes, that uh, really made it difficult for me. Um, actually, I think it's a really good idea to be handed the drinks like that because it makes it much easier. The runners are going, a lot of them are going in for water just, just to have a sip and to throw the rest on themselves. Well, it's clearly a special art in being able to pick up a polystyrene cup with two hands running at this sort of pace and I think uh, Juma Ikanga showed how it was done there. I'm surprised actually that Ikanga hasn't got personal water bottles because when you do pick up one of those cups you lose food and when you try to drink from them on the run it spills all around your mouth. Uh, some of the guys try to make uh, pull the lip of the cup together on the paper cup so that it narrows it down and they do get some water but uh, people like to take bottles so they can sip it and a bottle you, can, you need to take about 300 mils of fluid at each station every five kilometers and the guys like to do that keep up their fluid replace what they're losing during the race the leading bunch of runners including the two New Zealanders and then about a hundred meters back in a bunch of three we saw briefly there John Campbell Campbell has taken a very realistic approach to this race he knows only too well that there are at least half a dozen runners in this field that are a lot faster than him so he's going out there to run his own race and his intention is to try and run around two hours and 12 minutes which is very close to his personal best. Having left off Kahu Bay behind them, around past Kelly Tartan's world heading towards the Tamaki Boat Club and the next of the city beaches, Kofi Marama. one of the most exposed parts of the course so if the wind does get up this is where they'll feel it heading out for the Tamaki Boat Club which you can see in the background there which is also another very exposed part of this course two Australians running together Steve Monaghetti Robert DiCostello the 10k time of 31.09 puts them on about 2 hours 11 pace it's been fluctuating, and they're now into one of their slow patches by the looks of it, because the bunch is all back together, and Steve Monaghetti now come up to the front of the with the leaders. Still the 23-year-old Tanzanian, Simon Robert, who leads the field from his compatriot, Huma Ikanga, who 
Hussein down on the inside. Carl Thackeray, the Englishman, there as well. Carl Thackeray, as we said, won the English trial that selected the team for New Zealand, running in only a second marathon first occasion at running this distance was back in 1985 in the Chicago Marathon which he didn't finish and yet four years later he lines up for the English trial and wins it here he is as a result of that running in the Commonwealth Games running for a gold medal Bastion Point heading towards the Tamaki Yacht Club in Kohi Marama. There's one keen spectator who's getting a bird's eye view of this race running alongside of them out perhaps on his morning jog but I don't think he'll be able to stay with this place for very long. There's the second Welshman in the field we mentioned before, Steve Jones, out to the right there. Also in the red strip, number 1113 is Steve Brace. He ran a very good London marathon in 1989, finishing in 12th place in 2 hours and 12 minutes. Number 390 is another one of these uh, unknown British runners, Jeff 29-year-old, who was a surprise in finishing in second place in the English trial. The first two gained automatic selection for the Commonwealth Games, they being Thackeray and White. Well, still good to see Rex Wilson up there. They've gone through a quarter of the race, I guess, and Wilson looking well in this leading bunch. The only Zimbabwean runner in the field, number 1062, to the right of the picture there. Nayang Garagi. Two Australians, 0027 is Rob Di Costello, 47 is Brad Kemp, the Australian marathon champion. He's done two hours and ten minutes, so it's a very strong Australian presence in this marathon. Steve Monaghetti has gone under two hours and ten minutes. Di Costello we know about, and Brad Kemp, the number three man, who ran 2.10 in 1989. So the Australians are certainly looking for at least one medal from this race, and they have uh, good justification for those hopes as well. Very strong contingent of Kemp, Monaghetti and Di Costello. This is Mission Bay, lovely reserve here. People usually out sunbathing on the weekends, swimming in the sea. Uh, it's become a place full of restaurants who they come through picking up sponges this time. Usually you alternate a sponge station with a drink station. So everybody grabbing sponges early in the race, squeezing the water over their head, over their shoulders, over their legs, trying to keep as cool as you can. The amount of heat generated in your body once you're working on a day like this is tremendous. So you try to get as much cooling going as you possibly can. This Shahanga from Tanzania. He looks cool enough at the moment. Douglas Wakahuri on the other side of him, just dropping his arms, relaxing, conserving energy. All these men looking very comfortable, but of course it's still early days yet. We've completed 12 kilometres of the journey, so there still is 20 miles or 30 kilometres of the race to go. see Rob De Costello at the back of the field in the Australian strip and he's really soaked himself with water his shorts are quite wet you look up in front of him and uh, you can just see Douglas Wakahuri and look at his uniform he's not sprayed water around over himself too much at the moment No change at the top, but still the New York Marathon winner from 1989, Juma Ikunga, who leads the 1990 Commonwealth Games men's marathon after 12 kilometres. Minder is back, and Terry's giving Arthur a hug. And while we're away at the commercial break, we saw a little break in the marathon, just like we did the last time we went away. And this time it's four of them that have put 
the best part of 50 or 60 meters on the rest of the leading bunch and this group of four comprising of Ikunga, Hussein the Kenyan and the Red, Robert the second Tanzanian and Daniel Nzaoika the third of the three Kenyans and Douglas Wakahuri their number one man is still back in that main bunch 50 or 60 meters behind this group of four as the field make their way through Kohi Marama now heading to St. Helier's which is just a, a kilometre and a half away and the Rod Dixon's prediction about the wind is right it's certainly a lot stronger here than it is back in the city and the advantage that the runners get here is it's a tailwind now they run in this direction three times and head back to the city twice so they're into the tailwind for with the advantage of the tailwind for three of the legs and into a headwind for the two return trips to the city so they are getting the best advantage of the wind today on this course and as they're coming up the turn, isn't it great to see that angular face, that crew cut of Wilson's hanging in there in the bunch. I'm really pleased to see him putting it on the line and trying to run with the leaders. Monaghetti, Steve Jones, who we're seeing for the first time between Wakahuri and Monaghetti. Behind them, Rex Wilson and Robert DiCostello. Coming into St. Helier's, the most... Uh, eastern point of the course and shortly they will turn and head back towards the city. St. Helier's Beach in the background, the leading foursome of Ikanga, Robert Hussein and Inza Oika. You see this African bunch at the front of these four runners that seem to um, take a break from the rest of the field and I think it's because Hunger at the front keeps on putting in surges I don't think he's quite got the feel of even pace running yet because they seem to um, take off and get maybe 10 yards on the rest of this field and then it's not too much later the rest of the field seems to draw them back in again What do you think he's trying to do here Lorraine? Is he, is he trying to shake them off? Is he, trying to, is, he, is he making his play now do you think early on in the race? Well, it seems to be an African trademark to um, make these little surges, and I don't know if they're so much fitter than the rest of the field, but they seem to be able to get away with it. I think probably he will pay a bit later on. Well, I'll give you another theory that I got from a, a great man that I, I admired, Percy Sarity, and he said, you run with energy, and uh, like uh, you see children at play, they have bursts of energy, and some runners have these bursts of energy. They run along, they get a little tired, so they rest a little bit, relax a little bit, and then they feel revitalized, and so they're up and off again. Perhaps that's what these kids are doing. Well, you know, when you run with a dog or something, he usually does that, takes off for a burst and slows down and takes off for another burst, but they never seem to be able to last the distance. But it's quite obvious that there's been pressure going on as they come through the crowd of St. Helios, and that's the other thing that some runners get carried away with. They come through a crowd, they get a lift, a little surge of adrenaline goes into the bloodstream, and they pick the pace up. And you can see uh, that it split this bunch open quite a lot. But the front runners slowing down again a little bit now, and everybody gathering, and Rex Wilson trying to get back in there with these leaders, Steve Jones, Monaghetti, Douglas Wakahuri, they're the three in front of Rex Wilson. Robert Di Costello, Stephen Brace, the second Welshman, a couple of the runners from Botswana and Zimbabwe. Now our man out at the most uh, eastern point of the course where the field turns around and heads back to the city is Grant Nisbet. Grant, just how windy is it out there? Brendan, it's, uh, it is quite windy. In fact, it has been since the time we got here, about half past six this morning. I don't think it has uh, risen significantly, but uh, yes, it is, quite, uh, it is quite windy. I think it might have a cooling effect on the runners though, because as you say, the humidity is very high indeed. But I think they will be pleased that there is the wind which is coming straight off the sea and it would have a cooling effect on them. When they went past here, as you could see, most of them looked uh, fairly comfortable. I had a special look at uh, Rex Wilson. He looked in, in pretty good shape. There's a big crowd down here. And, uh, and as John pointed out, uh, they perhaps do get a little excited when they hear the crowd. And uh, some of them looked, uh, some of them looked to be in, uh, not, I wouldn't say distress, but uh, uh, the humidity is possibly having its effect. But uh, from New Zealand's point of view, Rex Wilson does look very good indeed. But uh, a very good crowd out here on the course, and uh, there's a wee bit of tension around, I think, as well. It's uh, certainly a long, long race. They haven't uh, gone a long way as yet, but uh, the crowd is uh, quite excited. A, work, a working day here in Auckland, as we know, and so I think a lot of people must still be on holiday. 
So into the headwind they're coming and the leaders slow down and Rex Wilson did the really great thing. He got into the bunch and he's looking for shelter at the back of it. That's great. Good tactics there from Rex Wilson because for the next eight kilometres they're into the wind. Now Robert De Costello, this may not look too good from the Australian point of view. He looks as if he just could be struggling a bit to hang on to this leading bunch and he doesn't look very happy with the motorbike either really needs to forget about what's going on with the motorbike and get on the back of that bunch and he knows it he's really making an effort to try and catch them because if he can't get on the back he's going to have a long hard road but i think he's quite right the uh, motorbike covering this race should not be in the line of the runners they should have a fair look at everybody of course these guys get concerned about fumes coming off of these vehicles as well De Costello working hard to try and join that main bunch, and I think he may be succeeding, digging deep, calling on all his reserves, because this is a very critical stage of the race for De Costello. If he drifts off this bunch now, he probably will never be able to join them again. And it might not be that Rob dropped back because he was feeling tired. I think quite likely at the water stop, he probably just lost a stride or two and missed the main bunch, and that's one of the dangers of the water stops. It's just... Um, getting behind a little bit he's the defending champion remember he won it in 1982 in brisbane and he won it again in 1986 in edinburgh yes decisions at water stops lorraine uh, i remember norman reed telling me that uh, when you come to a water stop and there's a bunch of you you have to decide what you're going to do tactically take your drink and leisurely take it down and if you're trying to really put the pressure on someone else uh, he used to say a favorite tactic of his norman those long ro uh, road walks was not to take a drink at one station and really sprint for it so the guy that did take the drink picked it up and he thought do I now take this drink and drink it or do I throw it away and chase the man that's putting the pressure on me early in the marathon the bunch still there into a headwind now going back out towards Auckland City coming through Kohimarama a very strong East African presence there with three Kenyans and two Tanzanians, Juma Ikunga, and across the far side there is Simon Robert, really the unknown factor in this race. Not amongst the fancied runners, just 23 years of age. Being given plenty of help and assistance from his teammate, Juma Ikunga, as we saw, particularly in the early stages of the race. The Africans, they like to work as a team. We've seen it on the track here at Mount Smart Stadium over the past three or four days in the steeplechase and in the 5,000 metre hitch yesterday work very well as a team, always conscious of where their teammates are in the race. And the two experienced Kenyan runners in this field, Hussein and Wakahiri, probably keeping an eye on the, the youngster in the team. There he is, Daniel Zoika, the man who's uh, running his first marathon outside of Kenya today. Well, Rob De Costello has almost made it onto this bunch. Here he is now, gritting his uh, teeth, he seems to be. Quite tight in the jaw, which surprises me, but he's back on there now and he'll have the satisfaction of, of getting shelter. It's important, as I say, to conserve energy. Douglas Wakahuri doing nothing at the moment. There's Steve Jones. Have a look at his face. Does he look okay? Looks pretty good to me. Douglas Wakahuri on this side of him. Steve Jones, who, in fact, for a short while held what is now generally considered to be a world record in the marathon. We used to refer to them as the world's best, but in recent times seem to have fallen in line with most of the other standard distances, and now we refer to them as a world record. Well, he held the world record after he ran two hours and five seconds in Chicago, but since then that record has been lowered by the Ethiopian. So going through the 15 kilometres and 46 minutes and 25 seconds so they have 27 kilometers of the race to go at 46 25 pace for 15 k's they're still on two hours and ten for the marathon distance this man simon robert putting on the pace again he's very keen in these early stages of this marathon is that an experience who knows we'll find out later as the goes but you can see he split the bunch open again everybody will be concerned now about the wind rex wilson still trying to get on there but de costello he's been dropped again he's not looking comfortable with these surges of pace rex wilson working hard as well to stay in contact with 
bunch. That's the gap between Robert Di Costello and the leading bunch. There's Nzoika at the back of it. It's Ikunga. Steve Monaghetti, Abraham Hussein, and Simon Robert, who has come back to that leading bunch. And the Englishman, Carl Thackeray, who's stayed in contact with the pace right from the gun. Rex Wilson is still hanging there, and I really must applaud his decision to go with the leading bunch there. After all, it's a difficult decision when you know that the guys in front have two or three minutes on paper ahead of you, and Rex had to make a decision as to whether to stay at the back and run his own best pace, or to go with the front and give himself a long shot of maybe coming off with a medal or um, a high placing, but it is a risk, and I think um, in a championship event like this, it's a risk you have to take. Back in Mission Bay, and this again is one of the sheltered bays, one of the sheltered parts of the course, so just for the next uh, few hundred metres, I'll get a bit of a break from the headwind that they're battling with. for the next, for this four mile stretch. It's very important that you stay with the bunch because you get a lot of shelter and once you start to drop off the back, it takes so much more work to try and make up the bunch again. So it's really important and I think Rob's probably in trouble here because he's dropped off the back and he'll find it hard to make it back up and he'd probably be better to relax right into it. So it's going to be so much more work to try and catch the bunch to wait until they turn around when he has a tailwind and he gets much more better returns for his efforts. So the three Australians who were all very much in that leading bunch on the way up to St Heliers, but in the space of uh, a couple of miles heading back towards the city into the wind, we've seen both uh, Camp and De Costello drop from this leading bunch and now the Australian hopes seem to rest principally on the shoulders of Steve Monaghetti right there in the middle of that leading bunch, just behind Juma Ikanga. Yeah, Rob De Costello looks like he's going to say goodbye to these guys because they're certainly going away from him now, opening up a big gap. De Costello looking very tight, not flowing at all. Remember, he's been around for a while and he got into this Australian team, I think, on sentiment as much as anything because they didn't feel that he was performing particularly well, but he's been such a champion for them. These are the men pushing the place. Juma Ikanga from Tanzania. He likes to do it. Has he got the strength to keep it up? Steve Monaghetti carrying the Australian flag in the leading bunch now. Just a young man. Comes from Victoria in Melbourne. Trained by Rabbit Wardlaw. And Wardlaw ran well for Australia. In fact, uh, he and Dick Quacks had a few good challenges and I remember Dick Quack saying uh, about Wardlaw one day if Wardlaw ever beats me in a race I'll scrub Queen Street with a toothbrush well Wardlaw did beat him in a race I'm not too sure I ever saw Queen Street looking scrubbed by his toothbrush though so Monaghetti carrying on a great tradition of Australian marathon running up here with the leaders at the moment here goes our man from Tanzania putting in a little burst again Simon Robert from Tanzania, and that's not the first time we've seen him do that. He seems to have this little desire about every four or five kilometres to put a little surge in. And is Hikunga going to go out and tell him to cool down again like he's done the previous times? Well, he's quite interesting uh, looking at his arms uh, here because he carries them quite high, and every now and again he relaxes them and drops them a little bit. As you can see he's got a lot of concentration on his face, just dropped his arms there as we came off that picture of him. It's almost like he's doing little surges of his own, you know, a few paces fast, a few paces a little bit slower. Six weeks ago, he ran in the Honolulu Marathon, where he recorded a time of two hours and 11 minutes, so he certainly would be one athlete in this field, but I don't think would be too concerned about the humidity if he can run two hours 11 for the Honolulu Marathon. Well, that's very true. Honolulu, known for its high humidity and warm temperatures, makes it very tough. 
Costello having to look at someone else go past him now. Number 1062 from Zimbabwe, Nicholas Nyungarayi. From the leading bunch comprising of Ikanga, Zoika, Robert, Monaghetti, Wakahuri over the back, Steve Jones, Carl Thackeray, and the third of the Kenyan runners in Zoika. So Kenya with three in the leading bunch, Tanzania with two. And Rex Wilson uh, not looking great at this stage on the back of this bunch. He's committed. You can see he's just hanging on there. But I must say, on the mark, Rex's courage, as Lorraine said, he made the decision to try and go and run and achieve a, an excellent position. And who knows what will happen to the leaders? Who's overcommitted? We really don't know at this stage. We really hope that Rex is conserving his energy a little bit, just staying as close in contact without being vicious. Pass to one of the great uh, attractions of Auckland in recent years, Kelly Tartan's Underworld. Still with the best part of 25 kilometres of the race to go as they leave. Tamaki Beach and Mission Bay behind them, now heading towards Okahu Bay, just a few hundred metres away. Now they'll get probably a tailwind down this part as the road turns in to Okahu Bay, and here's our man again, doing his wind sprint, Simon Robert, really bursting out one this time, and these guys behind him are probably cursing him and saying, why doesn't he run steadily? Because it's most upsetting. Hussein and Ikanga breaking away from that main bunch, so they're evenly split between Robert and the main bulk of the leading runners. Hussein, Ikanga, and then back to this main bunch, which is shrinking all the time with Steve Jones, Steve Monaghetti, Douglas Wakahura, Dalian Zoika, and Carl Thackeray. early surges it really makes it hard on the rest of the runners because it strings them out and it gets you a little bit overcommitted I think in the beginning stages of the race because they're not even at the halfway point and some of the runners are starting to feel it and if you're feeling it at this stage you're in trouble. Now Rex Wilson there he really needs to think out his strategy now because he's dropped off this bunch he's still got a headwind he's, he's going it's not much further for the headwind and then he's got a tailwind he wants to make up time, as Lorraine says, it's better to do it with a tailwind than a headwind. He now has to think about his position, maintaining his confidence, keeping himself in good control, keeping his stride going. These men out in front, just look how lightly they bounce along on the road. The experience, the, the tuppies in the race are still in that second bunch. Ikanga we know about, and the fellows behind will know about, but he does tend to die at the end. Simon Roberts, I guess not many of those guys uh, like Wakahuri and Monaghetti will know about. 32-year-old Juma Ikanga, we will always remember him at the Commonwealth Games for that uh, part he played in that dramatic conclusion to the 1982 marathon in Brisbane when he had that big lead over Robert Di Costello, but the Australian gradually wore him down and went on to win the race by a narrow margin and the Kunga had to settle for the silver medal well he's back here in the southern hemisphere in the city of Auckland eight years later hoping to go one step better and win the gold medal this time and he's making a very bold showing as they approach the halfway stage of the men's marathon it's Ikunga, Robert, Ibrahim Hussein who lead the 1990 Commonwealth Games men's marathon now these guys are pressing a really quite hard for a marathon race. You can see that they're really striding out. There's a lot of lift in their legs, so that means that they're running very fast. The Okahu Bay haul out area. Anybody who's got a boat knows that you can do an awful lot of work in this uh, in this place. And frequently, when you run by it, you smell the uh, the vapor of paint and, uh, and varnish and. Uh, if you like those smells, it's great, but if you're a marathon runner, you probably don't want them at the moment. But not many people working there today. So here's Monaghetti and Steve Jones. Douglas Wakahuri. Steve Monaghetti, who's really emerged as the number one Australian marathon runner in recent years. He's got a marvellous record, as we said before. He ran his first marathon at the Commonwealth Games in 1986, where he finished third in a time of 2 hours and 11 minutes. He was 
following year at the World Championships, fifth in Seoul at the Olympic Games in 1988, and then turned in his best performance at a marathon in 1989 when he ran second to Douglas Wakahura in the London Marathon, which is now one of the world's top marathons. He ran two hours, nine minutes and six seconds. And he's in very good form in recent months. In fact, he broke 28 minutes for 10,000 metres just a couple of months ago as part of his preparation for these games. So Steve Monaghenie, clearly the number one Australian hope in this marathon field today, now that Di Costello has gone. And Hussein, who's a bit of a surprise here today, the Kenyans felt that because he'd had a rather indifferent year in 1989 after his great performances the year before and winning New York and Boston, that he wouldn't be such a big factor in this race, but he's he's telling me ago that he's rather enjoyed the fact that all the pressure and all the focus has been on Douglas Wakahura. He's been largely ignored by the media and ignored by his, his own countrymen, and so he's been able to prepare himself quietly without being in the glare of the spotlight. And he was very confident about his chances today, despite the rather indifferent form he showed in 1989. And he's certainly running well as they approach the halfway stage of this race. And you can just see the legs of Ikanga there picking up over this little rise coming down off the hill off this little bridge to get onto the back of these two leaders and you can see that he really is moving very very quickly just think about it how would you like to run 42 kilometers for over two hours at the pace that these guys are doing they are really moving along the guys behind them will be running close to five minutes i'm sure these guys are running sub fives at the moment 20 k's in one hour one minute and 46 seconds which means they're still on 2 hour 10 pace for this race. And the lead group seems to be widening the gap against this small bunch. And, and we've uh, just heard from Grant Nisbet out on the course that a Carl Thackeray, who played a prominent part in the leading bunch for the first 15 kilometres of the race, has withdrawn, apparently with an injured leg. But still in contention, the Englishman Jeff Whiteman, there he is, number 390 over the back, the 29-year-old who was the big surprise at the English Commonwealth Games trial when he came from nowhere and finished in second place. The style of the 32-year-old Kenyan, Ibrahim Hussein, Juma Ikanga, running along this very smooth section of the Auckland waterfront. Good conditions here, protection from the wind, smooth surface, Humid, overcast day here in Auckland. What a marvellous shot that is. Douglas Wakahuri looking so strong and so relaxed. I guess if there was one from those leading seven runners that you could isolate is probably the favourite. It would have had to have been Wakahura, the current world champion. Jeff Whiteman, who seems to be revelling in this race today, the unknown man. Steve Jones, as we said, former world record holder, winner of the Chicago Marathon, another who's gone under two hours ten, as has Wakahura, winner of the London Marathon in 1989, winning by just three seconds from Steve Monaghetti. And this group looks very comfortable to me, actually. The question is whether the group at the front are going to burn themselves out. They seem to be changing the lead and spurring each other. And yet it's still early days, and I really think that we're going to see the winner from the second group here. A bold prediction there from Lorraine Muller with still half the race to go. But which one will it be, Lorraine? Uh, because they do look good, and I'm uh, really pleased to see Jeff Whiteman looking so good from England. Steve Jones, I think he's been struggling for a little while, but he's a very strong man, and it depends who has the strength at the last part of the race as they say you get to 20 miles before the race starts but here are the flying feet of the leaders and just look how well these guys are bouncing along still they're not packing up at the moment and their second 10 kilometer split was just over 30 minutes which means that they're running about two hour eight pace now so it's really picked up and you can see the stir surges still continue Hussein now putting the pressure on Ikanga struggling here in third place
back at Parnell, they turn and head once more out towards St. Helier's. And so for the next eight Ks, they have the advantage of a tailwind. And Rex Wilson was just coming up to the turn there, so he's still doing well. This is the scene on the Auckland waterfront at the halfway stage of the men's marathon, a fascinating race as we watch the Easter challenge coming from the Tanzanians and the Kenyans and the rather forlorn sight there of Robert De Costello who's dropped off the pace over the last eight kilometres and the Australian hopes resting very much on the man you can see in your picture at the moment, Steve Monaghetti. every day back on the Auckland waterfront this is the scene at the top of the field as we enter the second half of this men's marathon and while we're away there was again some interesting changes in this race with Juma Ikanga the Tanzanian who suddenly seemed to disappear he was overtaken by the Kenyans and he's lost the best part of 150 meters to Douglas Wakahuri and Abraham Hussein and now the only real Tanzanian challenge left to the Kenyans is in the form of the young Simon Robert and it's looking increasingly like Douglas Wakahuri is the man to watch in this men's marathon. John Davies. That's certainly the case. I mean, Simon Robert just did a big dash over the bridge uh, at the bottom of Ngāpipi Road, and uh, he didn't really know that Douglas Wakahuri was coming, but he knows now, 571, Douglas Wakahuri, that's the man that this race is going to evolve around, and you can see the pace is picked up by number 937, Simon Robert, and... Ibrahim Hussein has now got him with his teammate also, so all the fun and games, I'm sure, at the front of this race have stopped because Douglas Wakahuri is on the scene. He's here. He's now dictating the terms. The experience and maturity very evident from Wakahuri, who just refused to have anything at all with those roller coaster tactics of the Tanzanians. He's run his own race right from the gun, and he's run a very evenly paced race to date, and it's paid off. Steve Monaghetti, he could still be a factor, of course. And Steve Monaghetti certainly looks OK. He doesn't look like he's under any stress at the moment. And uh, he realises, I think, that the pace is a bit too tough from up front. He realises there's a long way to go. And look, he realises that the guys have slowed down. He's back in there also. So an Australian carrying the flag great for Oceania. Steve Monaghetti, just a relatively young man, but so much experience. In, uh, came to light in the Edinburgh Marathon and really didn't have the confidence to go out there and try for a gold medal. Well, it was uh, Waki Huri and Steve Monaghetti that fought out an epic finish in the London Marathon in 1989. And at the finish line, it was Waki Huri by three seconds over Steve Monaghetti. And there they are, the two of them again, after 23 kilometres running stride for stride along the Auckland waterfront, but this time it's for a gold medal. No money today for these fellows. Well, it's still over 10 miles to go, and Steve Monaghetti looks great to me, and you've got two runners here from the back pack with two runners who caught the front pack. Sorry, you've got the two runners who went out fast, the two Africans, and I think they'll probably, in the last miles, we, we might see them paying for that... Um, pretty uneven early pace and judging by things this man Steve Jones isn't too far off the pace and he isn't and you can see he is a very strong man can he be strong in the second half now some runners plan it this way they plan not to be too expensive with their energy in the first half and they are going to be uh, really putting it on the line once they go through halfway we're into the second half and it's a very interesting race evolving here everybody taking on drinks except Hussein When it comes down to the last 10K, that's when we really see the real race. That's where it all happens, and so much can change in that, those last few miles. When runners start to run out of glycogen, and you see the ones who pay the expenses for an early pace, and somebody like um, Steve Jones here, who's coming through. 
we might see him right up there, I think, in the last, but it seems to me like he's playing a really cagey General race, Rupert. and all his cards are out, out on the table yet. 34-year-old Steve Jones in fifth place at the moment, the man who won the bronze medal in the 10,000 metres at the Commonwealth Games in 1986. In fact, he's competed at the last three Commonwealth Games in 82 in Brisbane and 78 in Edmonton, running on the track in the 10,000 metres. But here in 1990, he's running in what seems to be his specialist event, which he's discovered in recent years, the marathon. And in sixth place at the moment is the Englishman Jeff Whiteman, and I think we might just be able to detect the Kiwi singlet in the back of the picture there, Rex Wilson. There's Jeff Whiteman going through. He's still looking reasonably comfortable. Got his eyes on those leaders. And the big thing I think uh, that has happened is that the pace has slowed down along that amongst that leading bunch. Wakahuri's up there with them now, and people are really starting to feel that they've been run over an hour. And Monaghetti uh, looking like he's the key man, but just look at Douglas Wak Wakahuri. Calm, composed, looking around been here for almost three months training for this event he's trained so meticulously for it as well in fact he's brought his coach down from japan shin Moreo. he's here on the waterfront today watching the proceedings with an eagle eye douglas wakahura who if he does win today i guess can probably lay claim to being the best marathon runner in the world he is the current world champion he won the london marathon last year he was second at the olympic games in 1988 given the world-class nature of this field if he wins today i think he can justifiably lay claim to being the number one marathon runner in the world but he's still got a lot of work ahead of him and steve monaghetti i'm sure has got other ideas as has hussein as has wakahiri's compatriot hussein a lot of press attached to winning a marathon like this rob de costello still in there fighting but all chances of winning his third gold medal in this event have disappeared he hasn't had much luck in his marathons in recent years he started as the favorite los angeles in 1984 for the gold medal finished out of the medals there and the same in seoul in 1988 finished in the top 10 but not amongst the medals and that looks as if it may well be his fate again today to finish in the top 10 but out of the medals Because it's an out and back course, the organizers, uh, John Fenton's the man that's been organizing the marathon course, done an excellent job, as you can see, and they put all those road cones out to stop the runners crossing onto the other side because uh, being out and back, you've got to make sure that the course is measured on the left-hand side of the road as they're going this way and on the right-hand side of the road as they're coming towards us. And the course is measured on the the runners take these days, so you take the shortest cuts you can to prevent them going too short on the cuts across the corners they put out those road cones. Steve Jones talking the way to Monaghetti in front of him. Well, for all the unpredictable tactics at the head of this race, they're still running at a fairly even pace going through the 25 Ks in one hour, 16 minutes and 56 seconds, which equates to two hours, nine minutes and 47 seconds for the marathon. So the pace really hasn't varied much between 2.9 and 2.10. Now, Jeff Whiteman will be really delighted because he is picking up that leading group and it's a great incentive at this time of the race. If he was a little tired before, he certainly will be feeling a lot better about it now. When those blitzes and those surges were going, it can be demoralizing. He sense the pace up there now has evened out and he's catching it up very slightly. He needs to get on to the bunch before they turn back again to come towards the city where they get those headwinds. Sixteen kilometers of the journey left. This is the man who's running in fifth place, the 29-year-old Englishman, Jeff Whiteman, representing his country for the first time today. So two British runners, three from East Africa, and the sole Australian Steve Monaghetti the leading figures left in this drama on the Auckland waterfront as we approach the 27 kilometer mark. Well remember the 10k race on the track. Well, 
Douglas Wakahuri is the quiet man in this race. He's not really doing anything, just making sure that he reels in the people when he wants them to, just sitting in there, taking his sponge now, wiping his face down. Steve Jones, not looking too bad. Monaghetti looks well up the front there also. Douglas Wakahuri at the back of that leading bunch. He's not just a gifted athlete, he must be one of the very few people in this world who's fluent in three extremely diverse languages. He's fluent in Japanese, where he's been based for the last seven or eight years. He's fluent in English, and he's fluent in Swahili, the native language of Kenya. And in fact, he also speaks a fourth language, Kikuyu, the language of his tribe. Really is very much uh, the paragon of the international marathon runner. He's based, as we said, in Japan, where he's lived for the last six or seven years. He has a home in Nairobi, but of course does a lot of his training here in New Zealand. He comes here, in fact, most years, has done for the last seven or eight years, to prepare quietly out of the spotlight for the many big meetings that he's run. World Championships, Olympic Games, and the Commonwealth Games. He was coached, of course, uh, by a well-known ja uh, Japanese gentleman called Mr. Nagasaki. Nakayama, Nakamura. I'm sorry. Yeah. Nak Nakamura, yes. And oh, oh, Jeff White, he's trouble. in real trouble. Looks like he might be suffering from cramps. At the 27 kilometre mark. Maybe the humidity is getting to him. I think it's probably the weather, that very high humidity, and we're sure to get quite a few casualties. And that's a bad position to be in. Once it starts to go, it's very difficult to get it back. Looks like it might be some problem with his, with his ankle. It seems to me his calves are cramping. He's, he's obviously in real pain, and he's still got the best part of 16 kilometres of the race to go. So his medal chances have disappeared. That leading bunch shrinks now down to five. They've really got a very clear lead over the next runner who was white. Probably back to someone like uh, Di Costello or one of the uh, Zimbabwe runners there. And we're about three or four kilometres away from St. Helier's. Where they'll turn for the second time, head back to Parnell, where they turn again, and then do their last eight kilometres running in the direction they are now, back to St. Helier's, where the race will finish. It's uh, just coming into Koimarama again. Uh, you can see the high rise buildings at the city end of Koimarama, and from here to the start of the turnaround is uh, just over one, or just on two kilometres. Some years ago, I don't know who the organisation was, but they put out markers on this road, uh, which were called cardiac markers, so it's a great training ground for a lot of Auckland athletes. But here's Whiteman again in trouble with those legs, and this is really quite tragic. The condition's very humid, uh, losing a lot of body fluids, a lot of body salts come out when you, when you sweat so much, and Whiteman is suffering for that. Of course, coming from England, he's uh, nowhere near used to these sorts of conditions. You can see that he's in some agony and he'll try and keep going because he's in a good position. Well, probably Whiteman has come here with the English team just in the last week or two, and that really isn't enough time to acclimatise to the conditions here in Auckland. And we've noticed that on the track that the English athletes that have done well on the track, like Eamon Martin in particular, are those that have spent two or three weeks, probably four or five weeks here in this peculiarly humid climate acclimatising and the results are paying off. Eamon Martin, who won the gold medal in the 10,000 metres with a very good performance, and has shown the benefits of spending at least a month here in Auckland before you race. But the humidity won't worry the Kenyans. In fact, uh, Douglas Wakahura is an interesting Kenyan in as much that he comes from Mombasa, which is down on the coast, which is a city with a climate very similar to Auckland. It's that subtropical, humid type and although he, in fact, uh, spends most of his time in Nairobi now, he has the advantage of both uh, having lived at sea level, where it's humid, and also having lived at altitude, so he can handle any sort of conditions. One of the few runners, in fact, from Kenya that comes from one of the coastal regions. Most of their great distance runners, of course, come from the high plains of central Kenya and the northwestern region where the Nandi runners come from, but uh, Douglas Wakahuri is a Kikuyu from the same tribe as Julius Kariuki, who won the gold medal in the steeplechase, and John Ngugi, who's expected to win the gold medal in the 5,000. The Kikuyus, not renowned for their great runners, they tend to dominate more in the commercial and political life in Kenya. In fact, the, the founding father of the modern independent nation of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, was from the Kikuyu tribe, the same tribe as Douglas Wakahuri, but in recent years, they've started to produce some great runners as well. Talking of acclimatising, 
Tony Getty didn't want to come to Auckland until just a couple of days before the marathon and uh, there were some arguments that took place with their team selection and their travel plans were announced and he said I don't want to get over there too early because he wanted to sleep in his own bed eat his own food at home for as long as he could before he came here but here's Rex Wilson who we think is currently in eighth place so he's running very well looking a little tight little drawn in the face now so he's run hard for that position if he can, can keep going he can hold it that will be a great result for Rex Wilson guys all look so easy to me and maybe our viewers don't appreciate how fast they're running because in fact they're running about five minute miles and they make it look like they're just going for a Sunday run but if anybody got out and tried to run, run just one five minute mile maybe they can appreciate that these guys are running 26 five minute miles all back to back without a rest in between. Yes well I was about to say that we'll probably get to see the marathon ever run in New Zealand today but of course strictly speaking there was a marathon run here on this very course in just over two hours wasn't there John? <laughs> yeah. Now the Oaraka Club don't like to re be reminded about this uh, Brendan but there was a short course that's correct and somebody ended up with a time Franco Fava from Italy I think it was fact, ended up with a time of two hours and two minutes now he thought that was wonderful. In fact I remember Rod Dixon he ran on that race that day and couldn't believe his luck when he crossed the finish line and was told that he'd run the marathon in about two hours and three minutes. Uh, two six I think it was for Rod Dixon. But Rex Wilson, uh, not Daniel, Daniel Zioka, that's Rex Wilson. And you can see he's a little tired. Notice his knees not coming up so high. His arms are a little tight. He's a little drawn in his face. He's still got a long way to go, but he will be trying his hardest to hold that position. Now, a little pressure going on here from Monaghetti. Steve Jones dropping off this bunch again. So it's been very comfortable for these runners until now. But we're getting to the business end of the race. Back at St. Helier's, which is the traditional conclusion of the great uh, Auckland City fun run. Round the Bays run, which ends here on this domain, and not surprisingly, it's here where most of the spectators have assembled to watch this race. Juma Ikanga, who played a big hand in the first 10 kilometres of this race, but suddenly disappeared in the space of about one kilometre around at the turnaround point at Parnell. Now he's about 300 metres behind these leaders at the moment. And again, another surge going on, probably the left of the spectators, getting the runners excited again. That's Daniel Mazzicchia from Kenya. This is Nzuoika from Kenya. And about 60, 70 metres behind him is Rex Wilson, the leading New Zealander at the moment. Robert Di Costello, who's really working hard and doesn't look terribly comfortable at all. Now he's about one kilometre behind the leaders, Brendan. Well, down there at St. Helier's is Grant Nisbet, and certainly, Grant, since we were last there, there's been a, a large increase in the number of spectators. What's the atmosphere like down there? Oh, it's marvellous down here. Um, Brendan, I'm just watching uh, Rex Wilson go past me now, and I just had a look at the clock, and he is about 50 seconds now behind the leading bunch and not looking as good as he did last time past and who can blame him it's uh, a very humid day here in Auckland as we said last time and but there is a significant breeze coming off the off the sea here and I'm just trying to find if I can see any more New Zealanders coming through the leaders went through here St Helly is about one minute ago Rex Wilson as I said is about 50 seconds behind and uh, we haven't had any sighting of the other two New Zealanders in the race uh, John Campbell and uh, Paul Hurley and uh, I still can't see any of them. And we've come now for, what, a minute and a half since uh, the leaders went past us here. But, uh, yes, tremendous excitement. And I'm sure there'll be even more excitement when the race finishes down here at St. Helier's. And what's the wind like, uh, Grant? It was, uh, seemed to be pretty strong the last time they were out there, but it possibly has died a bit, is it? Yes, I think possibly that's right. Uh, it was quite significant uh, about half an hour or so ago, but it, it, it seems to have just dropped away just a little. But uh, there is still considerable wind, certainly more than, the, uh, than about the three knots that we had around about 6.30 that uh, came up on the screen. It was a lot more than that, in fact, and uh, I would say still uh, 10 to 12 knots out here. We'll catch up with uh, Grant Nisbet as soon as he gets some information on uh, John Campbell and Paul Hurley, who are expected to arrive in St. Helier's probably in the next uh, couple of minutes. Meanwhile, the leading bunch of runners have uh, left St. Helier's behind them and are heading back into the wind to Parnell with just over 12 kilometres of the race to go.
back on the Auckland waterfront, the leading bunch of four runners at Steve Monaghetti, the two Kenyans, Hussein and Wakahuri, and uh, the real dark horse in this race, the wild card, Simon Robert. Unfancied, unknown, but he's there, very much in contention for a gold medal at the moment. But back at St Helier's, not far away from where these athletes are at the moment, to Grant Nisbet has some news on the New Zealanders. Grant. Yes, well, I haven't seen uh, John Campbell go through at all, uh, Brendan. Maybe I missed him, maybe I blinked, I don't know. But Paul Hurley, he uh, went through just a few minutes ago. He's exactly three minutes down on this leading bunch that you can see now. And Robert De Costello, in fact, was just a minute ahead of him. He was uh, two minutes behind the main bunch. So De Costello, obviously, nowhere near in contention this time round. So Paul Hurley, he about three minutes uh, back, uh, looking reasonable, one could say. And as I say, I haven't uh, yet seen John Campbell, but I may just have missed him. But uh, it's a, it's a long time now, so uh, whether he's still in the race or not, I'm not exactly sure. Well, he might have stopped at his shop for a cup of tea because he lives only 100 metres or so from the course, but that's uh, John Davies about Paul Hurley because these fellas are on about two-hour ten pace, and if he's three minutes behind them, he must be pretty close to a personal best. That's correct. He's uh, got a personal best of about just under two hours 16, so he's running very well today. Grant Nisbet certainly earning his uh, salary today. I think he's in fact uh, ferreted round and picked up some information on John Campbell. Grant. Yes, in fact, he's just run past me, uh, Brendan. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how far down he is now. <laughs> I forgot to look at the clock, but I think he would be five minutes down, two minutes behind Paul Hurley, and not looking uh, in great shape, I must say, but uh, he's still in the race, and uh, about five minutes off the pace, I think. So we've uh, got a measure on all three New Zealanders in the race at the moment. Uh, Rex Wilson in the top ten. Paul Hurley running 2 hours 13, 2 hours 14 pace, close to his personal best. And John Campbell, who finished 12th in this race four years ago at Edinburgh in 1986 when he ran 2.20, is probably running slightly faster than that today. But uh, he'd probably be a little disappointed because he was expecting that he could run somewhere around about 2 hours 12, 2 hours 13. But he's not on that pace at the moment. But these fellows here are certainly on 2 hours 10 at the moment. That's Steve Monaghetti, Simon Roberts, Douglas Wakahura, and Ibrahim Hussein. I'm just so impressed with Steve Monaghetti today because he really has come on as a marathon runner. He runs with so much more confidence uh, than he used to, being very well prepared, as I say, by his coach, Rabbit Wardlaw, as we call him. Steve Monaghetti, the boy from Ballarat, from that uh, historic town, 100 kilometres west of Melbourne. He's got a good, solid background in cross-country running. A lot of his strength from. In fact, uh, won the Australian Junior Cross-Country Championship in 1982. And that's when he first came into prominence on the Australian scene. And has been a senior at the World Cross-Country Championships for the past five years. And is the current Australian National Cross-Country Championships. And has a very strict uh, regimen when it comes to his marathons. He only runs one a year. And Ibrahim Hussein looks like he might be struggling a little bit to me. His stride has just shortened, his arms have come up and he might be paying for that early early pace That's right, he's certainly starting to look a little tired, his arms coming up, he's just struggling a little bit in there, but Monigetti looks good and so does Douglas Wakahuri and the mystery man Simon Robert still looks fine to me, the man that was doing all the dashing around and he's really racing this. Uh, you can come into marathons with pace charts, with times written in your hand. If you looked at Simon Roberts' hand, you wouldn't find any times on them at all. He's just come in here to treat it as a race. And Douglas Wakahuri just pushing him out of the way because uh, Simon Roberts coming across to get a sponge. On a Getty, two sponges. Keeping his legs cool, keeping his head cool. This man starting to look tired. He's still running at a good pace. Steve Jones from Wales, coming through St. Helier's Bay. You can see that Hussein starts to look as if he's going and going to drift off this pack. And uh, Jones from Wales will be watching that, and that will be a spur to him lying in fifth place. We're coming up to the 20 mile mark, and this is where it really starts to count. And you've got those runners at the back Steve Jones, Rob D. Costello. Um, have dropped off the pace, Ibrahim Hussein now, and this is where it's just, you've just got to gut it out, this is where you've trained for it, they just, it's starting to hurt, it's 
just a mental game from now on, just a matter of keeping going. Usually at this part, you might have felt really springy at the beginning of the race, but the spring goes out of your legs and it's just a grind. So Hussein looking forward now to 10 kilometers of grind, but this man is still going. Jeff uh, Whiteman still keeping uh, himself together and you can see he's still in some pain but he's gone through those bad cramps obviously he did the sensible thing getting the coldest water he could onto it out of the sponge but look he's a courageous man trying to keep going and this is the agony of the marathon once again stopping to and uh, another one who's pulled out of the race, number 938, that was Alfredo Shahunga, the Tanzanian. He's the brother of the man who won the gold medal in this event in 1978. So the humidity has certainly taken its toll here. A field of 29 started at 7 o'clock. Less than that on the roads now. And 29 outstanding marathon runners, some very good marathon runners. And this is one of them, Ibrahim Hussein. Just uh, recently ran in Honolulu very free running Kenyan guy a really nice chap had an unfortunate experience in Seoul and he's not going to be happy if he misses out on the medals here because I'm sure he would like a Commonwealth Games medal but three of them up front here Simon Roberts Robert, Robert um, in second place there Monaghetti leading them through Douglas Wakahuri in third place and Simon Roberts is the only one who survived that early pace and he's done it so well he's still looking good to me now, interesting story about Douglas Wakahuri because at Seoul he felt that he went out at the very end of the race too hard and lost the gold because of that. And so when he came to the London Marathon, uh, which he won this year, or last year I should say, he didn't make his move until about four metres from the end of the race because he said he didn't want to have the experience of going too early again. So is this the tactic of Douglas Wakahuri? He'll run with anybody in the lead until the last 400 metres and then he'll sprint away for the gold medal. Well, we could see the repeat of last year's London Marathon with Douglas Wakahuri and Steve Monaghetti fighting it out in the last 100 yards. And Simon Roberts just put in another little burst there, which really surprises me. He's just young. He's um, unfettered with a lot of uh, scientific facts. He just seems to be playing out there. Robert Di Costello. Now, two, or well over a one kilometre behind the leaders, coming through St Helier's Bay. And Rob will just gut it out to the end. He's such a tough runner, and there's no way that he'd give up. He'd give his absolute best right to the finish. When you look at uh, Douglas Wakahuri, it's hard to believe he's been running at this rapid pace for an hour and 40 minutes he just looks so fresh and so controlled and looks like he's got plenty of energy left for the last 30 minutes the real testing time in a marathon they often say in these races the race really begins at the 20 mile mark it's all about what your body can withstand over the last six miles and Douglas Wakahuri looks in very good shape for the testing part of this race Yes, that was a good old Lydiaism, Lydiaism if you like. Uh, he was the man that said to all of his marathon runners, you just stay in there for 20 miles and that's where you start the race from. But these three guys, I do like the look of them. They're all looking very well. Monaghetti uh, pressing, pressing, and as Lorraine said, uh, remembering London last year. He knows that he needs to break Douglas Wakahuri, but the fireworks, I think, will come when they make the turn. Of course, uh, that very fast 10,000 metre time that Steve Monaghetti ran last month in Australia, where he went under 28 minutes for 10,000 metres, means that he must have a lot of confidence going into the last six miles of this race, John Davies. Oh, it's a great thing to do, to run under 28 minutes for any man. And Monaghetti, who has been running about 28, 20, 28, 15, came out with an excellent race. And he's been acting as a pacemaker for many of the Australians in 5K races also, getting his speed together. So you do two things, I guess. One is you train for your strength, and in the end, you know you want a bit of speed. And Monaghetti's been doing that, working on his speed. He's got the strength. He's developed that over a, a number of years now of long running, and now he's tuned himself up with some great track races. And that certainly has, Brendan, given him good confidence for this race. In fact, he was originally down to run the 10,000 metres here as well. And when the entry list came out about a week ago for the 10,000 metres field, which you will recall was a straight final, 
Monaghetti was the fastest in the field. He ran the fastest time in the Commonwealth at 10,000 10, metres last year. And perhaps he did toy with the option, perhaps, of running both of those two events, the 10,000 metres and the marathon, but has wisely stayed with the race that he knows best this distance, the 42-kilometre journey, the marathon. We'll be back with more from the Auckland waterfront in just a moment. No change at the front of the field. It's still the same trio of Moni Monaghetti, Wakahuri and Roberts. Australian, a Tanzanian and a Kenyan making their way towards Parnell where they'll turn around and head back for the last section of this marathon which has now been in progress for an hour and 45 minutes. So these fellows have about 25 minutes at the most left. And at the end of the race, one of them, of course, will collect a gold medal. And again, we're seeing a little surge here from uh, Simon Roberts because the crowd on the bridge is... So he really reacts to crowds, and I think uh, Wakahuri and Monaghetti should watch out for him because if Robert is in the uh, finish with those and there's a crowd there, I think he'll be a danger man. Must be, I guess, uh, frustrating, John, for, for Wakahuri and Monaghetti, who know each other so well. And I guess if they just had each other to concentrate on, it would be a little easier. But they're probably a bit worried about this fellow. They don't know what he's capable of or what, what he's going to do over the last 10 or 15 k's. That's right. How fast will he be at the finish? How fast can he run 10 k's? And uh, what is his best marathon before? And these guys, as you say, will not know an awful lot about him. They'll know all about Steve Jones and so forth, and they'll know about each other because they've competed against each other well in the past. So they'll be worried about him and not too sure how to handle him. It's amazing that he's, he's still running so well when you consider that he, he ran 2 hours and 11 in the Honolulu Marathon just six weeks ago. It seems to defy all the, the beliefs of that you, you can't recover in six weeks from one marathon to the next. Well, he's new on the scene, 23 years of age, often the case in marathon running and when you look at the statistics on men marathon runners in particular you frequently find that their second marathon is the best one they ever run and I think from memory Steve Jones was one of those guys he came out ran a very good marathon and then he came out and ran a world's best in Chicago some years ago so Simon Robert the 23 year old from Tanzania hoping to become the second Tanzanian to win the gold medal in the Commonwealth Games Marathon. His countrymen did it in 1978. Gidamis Shahanga in Edmonton. And Juma Ikanga came very close, of course, in Brisbane in 1982 when he was just edged out by Robert D. Costello in that thrilling finish. And I remember Gidamis Shahanga coming into the stadium in Edmonton in those days and uh, with, was with Keith Quinn and we both looked and thought, who on earth is this? And everybody, including the BBC, who have wonderful statistics about everybody, was scratching their heads to find out much about Shahunga. And this man, Simon Robert, could well do the same again today. He's making his name in this race, that's for sure. He just made another little surge and went out and the, the come back together into their little group. Steve Monaghetti seems to be asserting his... Uh, himself in this race. He's been out in front for most of this four-mile stretch, which has been into the headwind. Douglas Wakahuri is just sitting in behind, just biding his time, I think. One of the advantages to running in front is that you don't really have to worry too much about the other runners. You can't see them, so your mind's not filled with a lot of thoughts about how they look, whereas the guys behind have to look at you, and if you're looking good, they start to get worried. I'm sure these guys are pretty much aware of who's where, though, in this little bunch. Well, just looking at the way they've lifted themselves up, I'd say Monaghetti was putting in a little bit of a burst then, starting to test people. And you can see Wakahuri just easing up between those two. little surge by Steve Monaghetti who seemed to be smelling the turnaround in the home stretch which is another four mile stretch with the wind behind him and here they go around the turn and I guess uh, Lorraine there's a big psychological advantage now with this uh, the wind at the back with the wind at your back all the way home for the last eight k's that, that must lift you a little well it certainly does it makes it a little bit easier when you're really starting to feel the crunch of the last four miles to have a tailwind and I think we're going to see a lot of um, the, the tactics of the race unfolding because it's going to be in this last four miles that if anybody's going to make a move, the guy's going to 
make it soon. Interesting to see Steve Jones picking up Ibrahim Hussein. So Jones probably going to move into fourth place, but it certainly looks like this is where three medals will come from. Who will get the gold? Who will get the silver? Here's Ibrahim Hussein going around. Jones closing in on him. Well, down there at the turnaround point, uh, hopefully we've got Rod Dixon. Can you hear me, Rod? Yes, I'm with you. And uh, the excitement down here is uh, is a carnival atmosphere. The uh, public of uh, Auckland and New Zealand are giving tremendous reception to these runners as they go through. I must say that the first three runners do look incredibly strong. Their, their muscles are glistening from the perspiration and they really do look in great shape for this uh, final leg back to St Helios. And uh, just as I'm uh, talking to you now, I can see Rex, uh, Will, Rex Wilson coming through. Well, Rod, do we've been uh, speculating here on these uh, two fine athletes, Monaghetti and Wakahuri, who fought an uh, epic final in the London Marathon uh, last year. Where's your money? Monaghetti, Wakahuri, or, or perhaps the wild card, Simon Robert? Yes, well, it certain, certainly does look uh, the unknown as Roberts, of course, but uh, that, uh, uh, Wakahiri and uh, Monaghetti both know one another and they've been in this situation before and it's going to unfold uh, now to, to a great finish. What are the conditions like down there now? Uh, to, uh, as you mentioned, at 7 o'clock it was quite windy and it was also very humid. What's the day like now on the Auckland waterfront? The breeze has dropped away considerably. Uh, the the uh, breeze has actually freshened, so it's slightly cooler now. It's not as humid as it was. And, uh, and I think the, the, the return journey will actually be a lot more comfortable for the runners. Now just bring us up to date again with Rex Wilson. Where do you figure he is? Is he still in the top ten? And how far oh, down is he on the leading group? Oh, definitely. He would, he would be a little over a minute down, and uh, he's definitely in the top eight. That's uh, Rod Dixon out on the course at the turnaround point at Parnell. So good news there for, for Rex Wilson. He's uh, running a very good race. He's not going to get a medal by the look of it, but nonetheless, a top ten finish in this sort of company would be an effort that he could be justifiably proud of. That's certainly the case. Uh, Rex uh, looked to me like he had picked off one of the Kenyans that had dropped off from this leading bunch earlier on, so he may now be in seventh place. But uh, these three are going to come down to the medals, and Wakahuri has been so comfortable, like Eamon Martin in the 10,000 metres, I say he's been the quiet man here. Steve Monaghetti on this side, but just talking about... Douglas Wakahuri because we, we tend to consider him to be a New Zealander. He's been coming here since 1983 and many visits and he doesn't just spend a week here, he spends quite a lot of time and they travel down to New Plymouth and I know uh, that uh, he trains well down there. He's been down to the favorite training courses and running tracks down there that he uses and he's been doing that for the last two months in New Zealand. And he first came here with that coach of his, Nakamura, Japanese uh, coach who ran against Jack Lovelock in the 1936. So Nakamura knew about New Zealand and that's why he brought uh, these Japanese runners and Douglas Wakahuri, the Kenyan that he inherited into his Japanese group, to New Zealand. He was familiar with our training methods, he was a great admirer of Arthur Lydiard and he knew all about the White Takari run. And in 1983 he brought him out here to see Lydiard and find out all about training in New Zealand. But here's Steve Jones picking up a very tired Ibrahim Hussein. And if uh, Rod Dixon is still listening to us down there, Rod, has there been any sign of John Campbell yet? No sign of John Campbell, no sign of Rod Dixon. Well, can you hear me, Rod? Yes, I can. Any yes. sign of John Campbell? No, John has not come through yet. We're still waiting for him to come through, so... Uh... Well, we'll keep in touch, and as uh, you hear something or see something of John Campbell, we'll catch up with you. Right. Meanwhile, back somewhere near the front, Hugh Jones and Abraham Hussein, who've been dropped off by Wakahuri, Monaghetti and Robert. And those two now, I guess, are just hoping to finish and hoping that perhaps one of those leading three might fade over the last couple of kilometres and they could sneak through for a bronze medal, maybe. Now, these two guys know each other well. Steve Jones runs in America. Abraham Hussein runs in America on the road races. And you can see them talking to each other. And it's great to see Steve Jones just turning around to Hussein, saying, come on, come on. So there's the encouragement of one tired runner to another. These guys are now hurting. It's tough. Steve Jones knows what it's like to be very tired. And Abraham Hussein, they're both experiencing that now. But look at the lift that these guys have compared with those two that we saw who were tired. These guys are excited. They're thinking about medals. They're thinking about the game plan at the end. You can see the inexperience of some of these guys. 
Simon Roberts there. Um, right from the beginning, he's been running wide on the tangents. Steve Monaghetti is very experienced. He knows to run the shortest possible route, so you need to really look ahead and straight line it from whatever point you're at so that you run the shortest possible course. This course doesn't have a line on it to follow, like a lot of marathon courses do. So it's usually the person in the front who has to decide the fastest possible course and it's a bit of an advantage for the people following because they can usually key off him and if he's not taking the shortest route they can but Simon Roberts has been running wide for most of the race and as well as running um, an uneven pace he's probably run over a distance of a marathon quite a bit further than the rest of the runners and he doesn't have his teammate Ikonga to put him right this time either. He's on his own up against the Australian and the Kenyan, but this is the battle of place. Less than five kilometres of the men's marathon left on the Auckland waterfront, and it's down to three men. A Tanzanian by the name of Simon Robert, unknown and unheard of prior to today, a 23-year-old who ran two hours and 11 minutes for the Honolulu Marathon last month. That's about all we know about him, I'm sorry. And the other two, two of the Giants, in modern day marathon running, Douglas Wakahuri, world champion, and Steve Monaghetti, yeah, who made his bad, debut uh, over this distance four years ago at Edinburgh in 1986, and hoping to continue that very fine tradition that Australia has built up in the marathon. De Costello, of course, winning the gold medal in the last two Olympic ga the last two Commonwealth Games, and back in 1958, Dave Powell also won the gold medal for Australia in this particular event. Now, Can Mon Monaghetti become the third Australian? And Monaghetti is now picking up the pace. I think he's decided it's time that he tried to run for that gold medal. He's picking it up. And Simon Roberts, you could see he's starting to look a little bit tired. And he's on the road to the right-hand side where he gets a little bit more shelter. And that's a sign that he's looking for shelter. He wants shelter. He's tired. So Wakahuri facing a little bit more of the breeze on the left-hand side. And Monaghetti pressing. see Simon Robert just drifting off here he's not taking any refreshments his arms have dropped down his palms have opened up so it's down to two men I think we can safely predict now Steve Monaghetti and Douglas Wakahuri and Simon Robert nonetheless with still plenty of incentive here because he's of course very much got control of the bronze medal in fact that's where his attention is going to be now what's behind him rather than what's in front of him because he knows that he's probably running for third place in the bronze medal right now just look at the determination the grim determination on the face of this 26 year old Kenyan by the name of Douglas Wakahura who's getting plenty of support here because he's been to New Zealand so many times in fact I estimate that he's made 10 trips to New Zealand since 1983 he has a large support group here in New Zealand in fact there is a group of 50 Wakahuri fans who are around by the turnaround point back at Parnell who've set up their banners and set up their little support group there and they're probably on their way now to St Helier's via the back roads of the Auckland waterfront to be there to greet their man when he gets to the finish line meanwhile Steve Jones and Hussein back and forth and fifth place respectively the best part of three or four hundred meters behind that leading bunch but Simon Robert he's trying to hang on Steve Monaghan took a drink at his last stop and Douglas Wakahuri decided not to it's uh, often a crucial time in the race and it's a decision as to whether to take the drink and maybe lose a stride or two but um, Steve Monaghetti seemed to take it so easily, right in his stride, he never missed a beat actually, and probably that drink will hold him in good stead in the last mile or so. He looks really good to me, he looks like he's just taking it um, pretty, he's not taking it easy, but he was um, not, at least, not at all uptight about taking a drink. I think John Davies at Wakahiri is getting a little frustrated with the tactics here of, uh, of Robert who's wandering all over the road. No, I just detected a bit of friction between the two of them there. Well, when you get tired, you get angry. There's no doubt about it. Little things annoy you, and the way the other runners come across you annoy you. But Monaghetti, you can see, picking it up. He's pacing it out. And interestingly, we thought Simon Robert was very tired. He knows how far he's got to go, and he's hanging in there. Steve Jones hanging in there for fourth place. He, Hussein, he's very, very tired. 
can see his hands almost up to the tops of his shoulders. He's suffering very badly and he's got another 5Ks to go. So they've been in progress now for just on two hours. They're into the last 4Ks of the race, heading for St. Elias with the advantage of the tailwind. This is Ibrahim Hussein, who's currently lying in fifth place, the man who has won both the New York and Boston Marathons, in fact became the first African for 92 years to win the Boston Marathon when he did so in 1987. And it's Robert, just when we thought he was out of the race, perhaps, he's, perhaps he hurt us, he's got a point to prove, he wants to prove us wrong, and he puts in another little surge carrying Monaghetti and Wakahuri with them as they make their way towards the Tamaki Boat Club. Well, it's great to be proved wrong by an unknown runner. And these two runners, Monaghetti and Wakahuri, must be surprised at what Robert is doing to them. Well, where these men are heading for is St. Helier's, and I suspect that there is a very big crowd down there now, just to bring us up to date on what it's like at St. Helier's, Grant Nisbet. Yes, Brennan, quite correct. Uh, there's a great area of expectation down here, and the people are watching the race on a, on a big screen that has been uh, erected here, so they're well aware of what is happening. And I don't know whether they've got their favourites or not, but there certainly is a great area of expectation down here. The breeze has, as Rod said, uh, dropped quite significantly. And in fact, it is only a breeze now. It was a bit, bit more of a wind uh, previously, but uh, conditions really quite favourable now for the runners. And we expect them here in about, what, 10 minutes' time, I suppose. Grant Nisbet down there at St. Helier's. Well, uh, Rod Dixon is hopefully listening to us back at Parnell, and he's brought us up to date uh, with Rex Wilson. Perhaps he may be able to give us an update on Paul Hurlihy and John Campbell. Rod? Yes, Brendan, uh, we've sad news is Campbell has uh, withdrawn from the race. It was at the Narpithi Bridge. Uh, the medics have said that uh, he is in good shape, but he uh, just can't continue. And uh, Paul Hurlihy went through at 1 hour and 57. So that's uh, nearly five minutes ago. We saw Paul go through, and Paul looks very tired, and he's gonna, it's going to be a long, hard road for him back to St Helios. So when New Zealanders have trouble with these conditions on the Auckland waterfront on a humid day like this, you can imagine how much tougher it must be for many of the foreign runners, which only tends to enhance the wonderful performance from these three in particular, Monaghetti, Robert, and Wakahuri. And you couldn't wish for a better finish than this. Three of them, stride for stride, into the last three kilometres of the 1990 Commonwealth Games Marathon. And they're certainly looking uh, as if they're going for a very good time under two hours ten at the moment. You can see two hours three coming up. And there's approximately a mile and a half left so will it be the boy from Ballarat, Steve Monaghetti, or will it be the unknown Simon Robert, or will it be the world champion who adds the Commonwealth title to his growing collection, Douglas Wakahuri? I'm starting to feel a little worried a bit for Douglas because he seems to drift just a wee bit when those little surges are coming in from Monaghetti. Monaghetti pressing, he's the man that's trying to win the gold medal, he's the man that's looking and he's moving over now to get another sponge or drink. So he's keeping himself cool with sponges, Monaghetti. The other two ignore them. They are just wanting now to get on with the end of getting into this race. 40 kilometres coming up, so just over 2 k's to go. So who's going to show their hand first? Will it be down to the last 100 metres? Will it be a repeat of the London Marathon in 1989 when Douglas Wakahura edged out Monaghetti by three seconds? I imagine that the thoughts of the closing stages of that race are going through the minds of both of them at the moment. It's all thinking in the mind of the finish, getting yourself excited, wanting to beat the other guys, you have to forget about your tiredness, get the adrenaline up, and when they see the finish, when they get round this next corner and they can look down towards St Helier's Bay, they know what it's all about, and we'll see them lift themselves, but Wakahuri, you can see, has sort of got himself into another little gear now, he's sort of picked himself up, and he's on the shoulder of Monaghetti. <laughs> Steve Monaghetti having taken the water and taken the sponge, it's just amazing at the last part of the race how that can pick you up so much. I've always found myself that just taking a little bit of water in the last mile or two miles can give you such a lift and I think that he thinks he can afford to take the time to do that and I think it's really wise at this point. Um, Douglas Wakahuri is uh, not taking any 
concentrating, I think, on the end of the race, and he doesn't want to waste a precious second. Less than two kilometres of the race to go, going through the 40 kilometre mark in two hours, three minutes and 41 seconds. So they're still on about 2.10 pace. And in the mind of Steve Monaghetti must be the London Marathon finish when at this point they were just like this. And he really got blitzed by this man, Douglas Wakahuri. But he's also got to think about Simon Robert in here also. How good is Simon Roberts? Uh, how well can he run? How excited will he be at the finish? Has he got a good sprint? Wakahuri, very level, very straight, very upright, keeping himself together here. Fans, Roberts who we uh, don't know all that much about. They're doing very well for the Tanzanians. But uh, look, the gaps are starting to open up a little bit. Has he gone? He went, uh, we thought before, at about 5K, but his uh, hands are coming up right to the top of his shoulders. They're flicking up, he's tired. Monaghetti is pushing at the Australian flags, waving beside him there. He will be first boosted by the crowd as he comes down towards the finish. And Douglas Wakahuri will get a tremendous cheer from the New Zealanders. We've talked about how much he uh, is known in this country. Monaghetti and Wakahuri are behind them. Simon Robert Nali, I noticed they've added an extra hyphenated name to his uh, surname. Simon Robert Nali in third place at the moment as the two big names try to shank the unknown Tanzanian off with a kilometre and a half of the race to go. Monaghetti and Wakahuri. Wakahuri will be pleased to have got rid of this man because they don't have to think about him now. So it comes down to the two of them. And Wakahuri won that London Marathon by three seconds from Steve Monaghetti. Monaghetti will want to win this gold medal and carry on that great tradition that the Australians have in this marathon running. One kilometre of the race to go as they run underneath the trees lining Kohimarama Beach as they head for the last of the city beaches, St Helier's and the finish line with... Rangatoto across the inner harbour in the background. But they wouldn't be too worried about the Pohuta Kawa trees or the lovely vista out across the sea at the moment. Their eyes and their thoughts are focused on the finish line. Now just about in sight. So heading for a time of about 2, 10, 30, but time doesn't matter. Now it's gold medal or silver medal. Again, he looks like he's almost got a little smile on his face. I think they're going to come down to...